Yes, hello, folks. Welcome to the weekly Manchester United podcast. I'm your host, as always, Phil Brown. Join with my regular co host, the excellent James Rhodes. James, how you doing, mate? Pretty good, doing well. And you? Not too bad. Oh, I just lied, but uh, more than that, I'm doing okay. It's been a bit of an interesting few Other things. Other than all the bad things, it's okay. You know? <laughs> but uh, it's all right. Um, um, but uh, all good, I'm alive and breathing, you know, so I uh, can't complain, or maybe that's not a good thing. Um, but uh, lots to talk about, of course. I've uh, been very busy week since we last spoke. Uh, lots of things happening. The Xerxes signing got completed. Preseason game against Rosenborg took place. Uh, Delect Euro, Cambalo, Cambalo, Greenwood, Sancho, and lots of other stuff happening. So, so much to get through. Um, I suppose we'll start with the preseason game yesterday. Um, predictably, there was um, some reaction to that preseason game that I felt was a bit over the top, where people were already um, professing doom for the season. And um, I mean, there were some, not going to lie, there were some things there that um, <laughs> were, were were a hangover from last season. The number of, yeah. you know, about 22 shots they, they conceded in that <laughs> game. Uh but these were games that were once uh, you found out about uh, were in the corner of a column of a newspaper in the back of a you know a, a program or, mm-hmm. or, or a fanzine that you ignored because it wasn't really relevant. Most of the team that was out there yesterday will not be near the first team in the start of the season. But there was some that, mm-hmm. that, that were that you know still didn't look great. It was the first preseason game. What was your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean. In general, obviously, you have a team that from from Norway there that uh, obviously it's a much lower league, but at the same time they're also mid season, right? So they're in kind of peak fitness level. One of the things that does show that I think people do underrate a lot of the times. Um, you've mentioned this before on a podcast as well, though, is the gap between footballers is not as big as people often think it is, um, especially because you get a lot of really good athletes. Uh, you know, there's different ability when it comes to football and technical and, and these things separate players out, the football intelligence, motivation, a lot of mental aspects. But physically, there's a lot of athletes all across the world who, are, who play the sport. And so when you come up against a team that's in midseason, that is a senior men's team and is fully fit and firing, it's no surprise they're going to be faster than you. But it also goes to show when you compare them to you know, the, the, a bunch of kids at United who are not senior football players, the level, the gap between men's football and the youth levels is quite big. And it's hard to rely on, uh, it, it, you know, you have to look at that and, and give players time when they're coming from youth levels and things to get in. So not too much to, to, to judge into it. Um, I was hoping to learn a few things. I think, you know, as fans, there's things we're going to want to see this preseason improving, right? Um, especially tactically, because when you look at uh, preseason games, they're for fitness for sure, but also you like to kind of see how the team is going to play, at least how they're going to set up, whether they execute or not, the results are not really that important. And um, I do think there was a couple things I noticed, which was one, the goalkeeper coming out a lot more, uh, coming out higher in in a few buildup phases that United had, especially in the first half when they were trying to control possession. Um, and the center backs going higher. One thing I did think was notable because there were starting players in there was also that Mason Mount was a lot deeper rather than playing way up the pitch. He was more forming a partnership with Casemiro as a as kind of a double pivot or whatever you'd however you'd you'd say it, which is a bit more how we played towards the end of the season instead of having two tens and one person sitting back. Um, other than that. Not that much, not that much that you can take away from it in general. My biggest concern <laughs> would unfortunately be Casemiro um, because while it's a preseason game and it's yeah. the first one coming back, he looks, out of every player on that pitch, the slowest, the least yeah. interested, and the least fit. And it's kind of a bit shocking even in a preseason game to see that. To me, James um... – there was nothing learned by Casemiro that they didn't know towards the end of last yes. season. You know, so yes. he's someone that has to be replaced. I think you have to be really careful with reading too much into preseason games. Yes. I remember when Ronaldo made his debut for Real Madrid with Kareem Benzema and all those amazing players. And it was, was in Ireland and Dublin against uh, yes. Shamrock Rovers and they scraped a 1-0 win. 
right? Yeah. Now, um, like Rosenborg, just same thing. You know, they mm -hmm. were, you know, they they play through the summer, so players yep. were fit. Um, yep. and you know, in those games, it's about building up intensity. It's about you know, it's not about you know being at your peak. It's about yeah. um, you know recovery, recovery. You know, and, and build up, build up the fitness. Van Hall, I think it was one of his first season. Was he won on every, every preseason game? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Didn't work out. So <laughs> you have to be careful with reading too much into Correct. it. Um, Ten Hag was quite scathing to be fair after it. Yeah, he um, wasn't happy with it. Though, no, so I guess. <laughs> but, but that, you know, what that sounded like to me. It sounded like a guy that's well aware that he doesn't have a lot of defeats left. Correct. That. Correct. Uh, He's already someone that because I, I did think it was a bit surprising that he he could have easily uh, give a much more benign answer. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Preseason, we're just getting the fit, but he was putting that pressure on right away with yeah. players and saying this is not acceptable. Even here, it's yep. not acceptable. Yep. And look, I think when you have games like this. You want obviously people like Casemiro, Wan Bissaka, Mason Mount, what have you, to. Um, the, I don't give them as much of an excuse as I will give some of the young, other younger players. Of the yeah. younger players, if you can get one or two that yes. shows they're not far off first team level, that's a success. I think VTech, um, yes, did VTech very, was very well. Yeah, I yeah. thought uh, Toby Kyler played really, really well. Yeah. Uh, Kyler's interesting because he's 20. A mm -hmm. young kid that they got from Brighton, uh, defensive midfielder. He's at a point now where it's like, okay, you th this is this is where you you've you've either got to show you're a Manchester United player or move on. I mean, if yes. you, you look at yes. Manu, who's younger than him, you know, who's already playing for his country at the Euros. I'm not saying you have to have the same trajectory identically, but yeah. this is the point where you've really got to show you're a player, and that's. You're looking until you needed send another defensive midfielder, he has to s assume that there's a chance there. Yeah. So I thought yeah. he played quite well. I thought, you know, young, well, face done okay. Um, I didn't like the criticism of young Harry Mascot. I mean, I think people underestimate the nerves. Mm -hmm. yeah. United, you know, where you're on TV, you know, there, there's 20,000 yeah. Norwegians there. Uh, I think people underestimate, you know, how difficult that is for young players to adapt to that level of scrutiny, but um, but there were some positives for me. I thought VTAG was exceptional, you know, yeah, I thought he, he was really, 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 really well. Uh, I would imagine he will go out on loan. Um, I asked you this earlier, but was where was Anthony? Yeah, I don't know. You know, there's a few players missing who were recovering Mad. from injuries, you know, to the end of last season and, and on some fitness things. Uh, obviously, Maguire, we can understand, and and some of the others who've been who've had injuries. Ahmad had, has had some injury issues over the last year. It's one of the reasons he didn't play much. I don't know where why Anthony was missing from that game yet, as he did return with the first batch. Um, we didn't really get any explanation on that. So I guess we'll see through this week. But, um, yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm not a big biggest fan of, of of Anthony. I don't want to pile on him either, but there has been times when after internationals he comes back less fit than other players. I don't exactly and, why um, I'm not saying yeah. that's why but that, that's why it was missing, but that's something that yeah. And you don't know why, but you know, if he's back and he returned with everybody else, I don't know why he didn't wasn't fit enough for however to be selected to play with um the rest of the seniors that went on there, you know. Um Fitness, they obviously got to build and all of that, but you know, Wambasaka, uh, Mount, Rashford, Casemiro, they were there. I mean, every one of them. So, I, I'm not sure the reason. There's another one on on Saturday. Obviously, a week more of, of fitness under everyone's belt, and then we'll see. But um, you'd expect he's got to be able to make it into the preseason squads, right? On the flip side, um, young player that impressed was Halseth Nipan from Nipan, if I'm saying that correctly, young Norwegian midfielder that um, predictably there was rumours mm. emerging afterwards of United's interest in him. That's the type of player you would imagine that would appeal to any us and yes. United um, not wanting to repeat the Holland mistake. United have very good contacts in Norway. Uh, looks like a very, very good young midfielder. Yeah, and uh, did a nice preseason game that probably helped uh, help them over there make a little bit of money. So, 
you would think that uh, that was a smart play in there if they do have any interest. And there's some very kind of tacit reports on that. But he looked good. I mean, definitely among all the players on the pitch, he stood out for sure on both sides. Um, it was quite impressive technical ability. Everything he was doing was was smart. Um, really like that. And, and it would be lovely to make those kind of signings because obviously we'll talk about the midfield, but you have to look at it and say beyond Bruno Mount and Kabi Menu, you don't have a lot of settled midfielders at United. Getting more top young talent in for the future is important. Um, and you look at what Madrid have done stacking up their midfield and the number of players that they have there and that City have done over the years. Definitely quite, uh, quite impressive. You know, if there was one thing that stood out again for me yesterday was the fact that Mount and Casemiro can't play in the same midfield. Mm. Is that um, there has to be another player in there for me. Um, but uh, I just think that the gaps between them are, 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 are so big that uh, Mount wants to play really, really high. Um, hopefully he stays fit uh, because, you know, we haven't really seen Mason Mount yet. Yeah. But um I've never once seen a game where I felt I'm comfortable with how he fits into this midfield. I Me, mean, I obviously they didn't just send another midfielder. They have to, James. That is yeah. something they must do. Uh, I would be really worried if United went to mid the season with exactly the same midfield that they ended up with. Um, but I'm still puzzled as to how he fits in. I, I am as well, and and the midfield is a conundrum, right? Because when we look at the summer so far, we've got. Joshua Xerxes signed. You've got offers and bids left and right for center backs. Understandably, Rafael Varane has departed. So we'll need, we have to sign a center back. But the midfield is as much or more of a concern, no doubt. I mean, anybody who watched last season will look at it and say, this isn't going to work anymore. We can't do that again. There's no way you can just say, we'll, we'll run it back and it'll be better next season. Um, towards the end of the year, Kabi Mainu was suffering quite a bit playing in that team uh, until the little switch at the end of the season, where which was a much more compact team and is probably not in general the way we want to go forward. Uh, it was difficult. He was finding it difficult just because it was impossible to cover the spaces that he was supposed to cover in that setup. Um, we know Bruno Fernandes is going to play. We know Kabi Mainu is going to play. I don't know what the plan is with Mason Mount. It's it's confusing, you know, in there for sure. It's 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 sort of not understandable. I can get it if he's going to rotate with Bruno. And we're actually going to rotate him, and he's going to rotate with Kabi Mainu. He's he's actually going to rotate, but there's a lot of other midfielders in there. There's a lot more needed to balance that midfield out because you're going to need someone with some serious legs next to Kabi Mainu and Bruno. Not much less next to Mason Mount and Bruno to cover those those distances and and neither Casemiro nor Amrabat uh is that guy. None of neither of them has the legs to cover that those kind of spaces and distances and and do all of that. Um so certainly it, it's kind of the one thing where I think I could I could live with one center back. I really could and having Maguire and Lindelof and Evans as backup options I could live with that. I can live with our attacking options. I cannot live with the midfield options we have right now. I just don't see how it works at all. What I will say is any of us don't speak me the type of people to see a need and ignore it. Yeah. They look like the type of people that if they see a pressing need, they will do something to address it. Um, yeah. The fact that United have pretty much agreed a deal for Mason Greenwood, they've, um, of course, yes. uh, Willie Kwambala is out. That would essentially cover... Uh, what Xerxes has cost, yep, more or less. Um, so you know, there's still some room there to go do some stuff. I would imagine there could it will be other players being sold too. Um, mm -hmm. let me ask you about the uh, Willie Kambwala deal because to me, um, he he wanted to go, yes, it was the right thing to do. This is exactly what City and Real Madrid and other top clubs do is that. They sell players with the sell-on clause and with the buyback clause. Yep. And I think they got a decent fee for a kid that, um, without injuries, if there was no injuries, probably wouldn't have played for United this yep. season. He did do he did do quite well when he did. Um, but um, I have no issues with this thing. 
Yeah, it's a good one. And, uh, you know, similar, they did a deal with Alvaro Fernandez in the end as well, right? From January to, and they activated that option. A different one because it was a loan with an option, but a similar deal where there's, I think, a couple clauses in there on sell-ons and matching rights and things like that. It makes a lot of sense because what we've seen in the past is players stagnate. You look at, you know, Facundo Palistri has definitely suffered from this where, you know, this is the type of deal that should have probably been done for him two years ago now, where if he wasn't going to play a lot, sell him, get a sell-on clause, get a buyback in there and um, make a little bit of money back and and see how it goes and end up with all these young players out there. And the more of those that work out, the more fees you're going to get for those players in the future. That's one of the reasons City are able to do it because so many of the players they've sold have ended up being good players in the, in the future. Um, you know, Joshua Zerksy, who we just bought, Bayern had a, a buyback on and a 50% sell-on clause. They made 20 million from that, from that deal, 20 million euros. And so it's, I think it's a, it's a great deal and it's a sign of the forward thinking aspect of it rather than hoarding players like assets, you know, on a, on a book and saying, well, yeah, there's making that decision, you know, if they're not going to be ready to play now and they're at that age, then they're going to go. And it's also a matter of contracts too. I think it shows a priority where they don't want players walking for free and they're willing to sell them in that final year, um, which is the same reason why right now, of course, Victor Lindelof and Wamba Saka are in that, in that kind of position where they need to clarify their futures as well. Someone as well, Scott McTominay, uh, Galatasaray, yeah. uh, allegedly interested in him. Um, I think that uh, these are players that will be sold if the right offer arrives yes. um, in the past, obviously Scott McTominay, of course, is, you know, a, a fantastic for FFP if they sell him um, straight profit, um, but quite an important score player. I mean, it's, I think it's easy yes. to turn around and say, let's get rid of him without thinking about, okay, who else is going to come in? Xerxes gives you native what Scott McTominay offers them. He gives mm. them 6-4, he gives them height on set pieces, you know, going forward. He's not just a goal scorer. You know, I, I heard some of the stuff that Chago Mata said about him, which was quite interesting. Um, maybe overrating him slightly, but, um, you know, we'll he's see. a <laughs> player that uh, has enormous um, variation to his game that gives you know, something different. Um, so maybe Ten Hag feels that with Xerxes in the squad, he could let him come and he go. Uh, he was willing to let him go last summer, of course. He was Maguire. Um I think that these are deals that United would want to do earlier in the window um, rather than later so that Ten Hag's confident they'll get replacements. But um, you know, do you think, what, what do you think of Scott McTominay? Yeah, well, it's an interesting one because for me with Scott, it always depends on, like my feelings about him always depend on more what's going on around him. I don't want, I don't think Scott McTominay should stay as a player who's going to be regularly starting in the midfield because when that happens it doesn't work we need to make signings so that scott mctominay isn't relied on to be a regular like midfielder where he doesn't really have his strengths however scott mctominay is a squad player who comes in offers you something different crashes the box uh does a bit of that he's actually quite exceptional in some of those traits and so it's it's a little bit tough because it's kind of a luxury player in in essence, and and you have to look at it and say, is the player willing to accept a role where they're not going to play that much, and they're going to be coming off the bench when you need goals, you know, later in games. They're going to be you know rotating into games when you feel you have enough control to get some you know to get him in there where he's not offering you as much outside of that in the midfield, or or even that you're throwing him almost as a as another forward. So, um, you know, that, that's where it's, it's a bit tricky. And I think that it's really going to come down to him to a large degree uh, and the offers that come in. If, because they're going to sit there and discuss and say, one, if you're going to stay, we probably want a new contract. They don't want him to go for free in the end. Um, but what are they offering? What kind of wages? What kind of squad role? What kind of minutes? All of those things that are in that discussion. And will he accept that? and want to stay at United or will he want to leave? And if he does, then they're going to have to bring something better than, you know, 10 million from Galatasaray because you need more than that for Scott McTominay. He's worth more yeah. than that as a player. Way more. Sure. Yeah. You know, 30, 30, 40 million is a fair price 
for the player that scores the number of goals he does um, and, and his, his, his experience in the Premier League, there's a lot of clubs, I think, you know, you think of Fulham's and Everton's and, and West Ham's that could definitely take him and, and do well with him for 30, he would 40 million. A lot of teams that say yeah. the top seven for me. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, yeah, he would. I wouldn't want to. He is someone that if you if he's playing against you, you would be a bit concerned about because yes. he scores goals. You know, he's someone that scores important goals. He's someone that, um, you know, is awkward to mark. He's dangerous on set pieces. Um, he's someone that, um, you know, if, if, if you play to his strengths, you know, he, he, people always point out the things that he can't do, but the point about the things that he can't do. Yep. And there aren't many midfielders out there that you can get at that price that are getting you close to double figures. I mean, uh, in my opinion, Ten Hag wouldn't have a job without him. There's yeah. no doubt about it. Because <laughs> it was when, pretty bad at one point. Burnley, <laughs> did you think about that Burnley game? Yeah. Or was it the, uh, Brentford. Burnley, the two, Brentford. The two game. goals, yes, yeah. Brentford game of two. Yeah. That was massive. Mm. Yeah, in my opinion, it was right after the international break. United had been poor, or right before, I think it was. Yep, and, um, before, yep. Uh, and United had been poor. He scores two goals in the last minute to win them yep. a game that they badly needed to win. And before international breaks, when th that's when managers get sacked. Mm -hmm. And I would have found it really hard to believe that Ten Hag wouldn't have been sacked over one of those international break windows if... McTominay hadn't won that. You always felt like, okay, this is going to be the minute where United are revitalized. That this is going to be the moment where they kick on. Never did, but I think that he it gave that feeling for sure of like well. maybe we could build on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't be desperate to let him go. Casemiro, someone in my opinion, absolute certainty has to go. Yeah. If uh, they get a decent offer from Saudi, the wages you would see of everything else. Cut your losses and go. Um, Jaden Sancho. <clears throat> now, we've talked about Sancho before. I understand that everyone has their own views on it. And my own is what he did was wasn't so much what he did, it was how it was handled by both. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, to me, like okay, the, the offense itself, the you know, the response to the offense is almost worse than the offense itself. Right. Like, I think that if I'm Sancho's agent, I would have said to him, I don't care if you hate the guy. I don't care if you think he's 110% wrong. Apologize. <clears throat> yep. Because this doesn't help you to sit and not play for the next four to five months. And yep. I just, I think both were poorly advised. Um, I still have a feeling that it would be, would want to sell him if the right offer came sure. in. But what else can they do if there's no serious offers on the table? This is the only option available to all parties is the attempt to reconcile. And now Jaden Sancho is in an interesting position because he has to play his way back into the team. I don't know where he fits in the team, but he has to ask himself some big questions because for him to get a move, even if he still wants to get away, he now has to perform for United. Not for Bruce Dortmund, not for someone else. He now has to do... United, what he did at Borussia Dortmund. So he's at a really inflection point in his career where it's like either I focus on being, you know, a player that fulfills their potential and 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 a player that um, wants to be successful and does all the right things that you need to be successful, lives right, eats right, sleeps right, gives 110% in performances uh, and training. It's easy to fix, um, you know, being late. It's not a difficult mm -hmm. problem to fix. But he's at this point now, James, where he has to prove not just to Ten Hag, but to all of football Correct. that he's still a top-class player. Because if he doesn't, where's his next move? Correct, yeah. there's It's it's going to be really difficult there. And and that really is the problem. And, you know, the outcome of the whole situation that happened was a lose-lose for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's really why I think the kind of new leadership are so unhappy with it. You know, the club didn't win by freezing Jaden Sancho out and having his value go to nothing and paying wages for someone to not play for them and not have deals on the table and have nowhere but to send him. Did Ten win this battle? He didn't, but I think where where I where, where I said, I think that grown-ups are running it now is that forget the battle. 
right? Like walk away from the battle, essentially, is, what, is the way that I see it. Precedent? I think it's important to set up. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but there's yeah. another side to this where the club is like, this is not just about Jade and Sancho, it's about an example to other players. This is a precedent. The discipline will not be yeah. compromised. These are club rules. And if you don't Correct. adhere to them, so in that sense, that's what I mean by it, mind. though. That, that's what I mean in that sense is that when I take it, I take it away, like it's maybe you change the battlefield, right? Because you really don't want your coach going to war with players. You don't Please. want that. We've talked about that. Good. So you take yeah. this battle that's been Sancho versus Ten Hag and you say, that battle's over. Now Sancho's battle is to prove it to the club that he's worth something, that he's a football player. Now his, his battle is to prove it to the rest of the people in football that he's worth something, that he's a player who can be disciplined, who can do all of this. If, if, some, if it doesn't go well, it's not going to be because of Ten Hag now. There's no discussion that it's because of Ten Hag. That has nothing to do with a conflict with Ten Hag. It's going to be on him versus the club at that point in time. But that's how it should be. We talked about that. Some, And that's, to me, that's actually supporting the manager a lot more because it makes the job a way harder for them to do when they're having to fight those battles that they shouldn't have to. Someone See, has to take that off of them. Sancho is in exactly the same position right now that he was in September. Yes. And so... They find a way to reconcile the differences, train, get back on the page, and show you show your worth. This is exactly where he was in yes. uh, in September. And this is why you need good advisors around you that doesn't enable yep. your stupidity. Yep, is able to sit you down and say, "Look, I understand your emotional. I understand you feel you're right. I understand, but yeah, this is how we handle this." Mm -hmm. And and he had players and friends in the in the dressing room who were telling him to as well, you know, and just. Mm -hmm. Wanting to put it to bed, a lot of them. I mean, he's he's close with Marcus, you know, um, Harry Maguire. Them, they were telling him to put it to bed, you know. Yeah. And so, sure, on his side of it, definitely, it could have been a lot better. But essentially, with with Ineos and Charger, we've gotten a little bit of a, a reset. Everybody gets a reprieve a little bit on this and to to start fresh. Um, but that also means there's no excuses. There's nowhere so to play? hide yes. and nowhere to run. Where does he play? Where, where does he play? Yeah, I mean, well, Ten Hag bought Mason Mount with Sancho there. So yeah, he has to have yeah. some concept of a team where both of them can play in it. Where did, I mean, if you look at where well, he where he was playing last summer, was essentially in that mm. you know 10 position that fault you know false name, whatever you want to call it. It's almost what Zerx so, is gonna play in, funnily enough, but yeah, yeah. Then you have the issue of Ahmad and everyone else, and yeah. Okay, well, because they want yeah, to play too. I would imagine it will sell palestering. Yeah, for sure. And 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 then you, you still have Anthony too. But uh, you know, but I think that if you kind of look at it in some sense, if he works his way back in, and look, I think if he's sold, they probably don't replace him this summer. Okay, to be clear, right? So you know, if they do get a good offer, I don't think they're gonna go ahead and, and replace him now after getting Xerxes yeah. in. But in some sense, if you consider that Garnacho is essentially now down the right wing spot and United don't seem to be chasing a right winger at this point in time, then you've got on the right. And, and, and you remember one of the complaints we had last year that I think was valid, hence Xerxes coming in, was that the dynamic of Rashford, Hoyland and Garnacho didn't really work that great, even though they're your three best players by far for the front line, because they're all doing the same thing. They're all occupying the same spaces. They're all running into the channels and essentially in, in to some degree getting in each other's way. Um, and just from a team dynamics, it wasn't the best. So mixing the profiles, I think, in the front line is important. Marcus Rashford probably um, should have more ability to be benched uh, for his own good, for, the, for fitness, for health, for everything. But you don't have a much better right wing. So I'm kind of looking at it and saying, if if you can get Sancho going, the benefit is you could play Sancho with Hoyland and Garnacho, and it's less of a problem of profiles as it is when Rashford is there too. And so I would look at Sancho and say, he could be the backup left winger. If Garnacho is your starting right winger, then Sancho could be your backup left winger behind Rashford and provide something different Um Profile wise, and that would be probably the best place for him to work himself into the team. Uh, it would allow Rashford to get more rest, more rotation as well, and offer you something different, which I think is necessary in, in kind of 
fixing these kind of squad dynamics overall. So, so I think that's the best bet for him would be to work his way into that left side. Okay. So this is probably changing as we speak because there's been so much going on. The <laughs> Lenny Oro situation, right? So, um, yeah. you know, all depends on what uh, guy you want to believe. Uh, I was wondering who the uh, things are happening Guy was going to be this summer, you know. Yeah, <laughs> well, guy was going to emerge off the back of United with endless transfer rumors, um, people that I'd never heard of before. Mm. Um, so uh, lots of discussion about whether Lenny Yoro will come to Manchester United or not. Um, the reports, um, by David Ornstein are it'll be either Yoro or Delict. Mm-hmm. I thought it was quite interesting to see United allegedly go after Jonathan Ta, which seemed to me more or less a bit of a game of Bayern that either you drop your price on the lector we go after your target, uh, which is uh, some shit housery that we haven't seen mm-hmm. from in a long time, which was welcome. Um, but um, Lenny Oro, very talented young kid, 18. Um, some people say that uh, he will, will not go to United. Some people say that he will. What do you know about it? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of interesting there's there's things we'll never know um in terms of the discussions directly between United Lenny Oro and and Georgia Mendes. And they have a good relationship with Mendes for what it's worth. Ineos do as well. Um and so I'm sure they're kind of on, on top of it. And given the people that we have in place, I think it is quite telling the delict versus Euro situation. Um, I was pointing out recently in a, in a, in, in a video that, you know, the delict things kind of been sitting for about two and a half weeks now in almost the exact cool. same pot spot as it was before. I thought it became rather clear. They were holding off on it in case they can get Lenny Oro in who as described by, you know, Ornstein and others is almost like one of those unmissable opportunity players you go for. If you can get him, you've got to be in the discussion and to be fair, United have put themselves in the discussion. They've made a bid. They've been accepted. He's still not gone to Madrid. And um, and it seems like whatever reason there is behind it, they're willing to wait and hold off on pursuing or, or finishing Delict. And I would think they know what they're doing a little bit more than maybe the Frankie de Jong thing from a couple of years ago, which people draw parallels to, where... I think he'd more explicitly said no, and there was the hope that Ten Hag could bring him in as as his former coach, versus something like this. Um, they must have some kind of encouragement, you know. I think one of the things that's quite interesting in this, <clears throat> and I think one of the reasons why they prefer Euro over Delict is simply wages. You know, mm. Delict makes a lot of money. If you look yes. at Xerxes' wages, right? Xerxes is making less than what Brandon Williams was making, mm-hmm. which is quite staggering. And you can see that uh, <clears throat> Ineos have been working really hard to get the wage bill down. And I think their preference would be, okay, let's get this 18-year-old kid in. Uh, i be making a lot less money. The acquisition fee would probably be similar to what they're going to pay for Delict, but, yep. but they've been making be making a lot less. I think Delict is much easier to justify if you're getting rid of a Lindelof for a Maguire. Because yep. then it becomes a lot easier. So it's possible you need to go back in for a delict if mm-hmm. a Lindelof or a Maguire leaves, even with the Euro. Um, but you know, I think they're prioritizing players that aren't quite at that level yet. Um, the very top level where they can, you know, they're not paying 300 grand a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would imagine this will be the same with the Garte, um, because yep. they understandably they don't want to pay that type of money um and this is something that is very real for everyone not just united yeah. for everybody so yeah. i would imagine that you know euro exceptional young talent of course but also would be significantly cheaper On um, wages, yeah. and uh you know uh, real madrid are not stupid either james i mean they're not going to turn around and hand land a euro 250 grand a week nope. i mean the lure of Madrid is the club. Yeah. And I can understand if the kid has preference to go there. I get that. Um, but I think for any of us, you know, yeah, you look at all aspects of the deal. I think if you can do one between Euro and Delict, you do Euro. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Well, and, and obviously the money is a, is a factor, but it's also tying into that risk, you know, that risk factor. He's a younger player. You're paying a lot of wages for Delict. He's, he's had quite a number of injuries over the last few years as well. And the last thing that they want to do right now is make financial mistakes. So it's not that Delict is a, a bad signing or a bad player. He's a very good player, and I think he'd be a great signing. And there's still a decent chance that United end up with him this summer. But when you when you're talking about those risk that kind of risk assessment they'd certainly rather get a top young talent on lower wages who you know compared to some of the risks that they'd have um, sure. that they'd have to consider with Matthias Delict as well um and then you know uh, part of it is yeah i mean there there's there's definitely that aspect to it that's a, that's important so i think they they're keeping their options open and and i think the benefit the positive of it is not putting themselves in the situation where they're having to wait till one is done before they try to start the delict conversations. You know, I think it's that's the real benefit of it. If, if tomorrow Lenny Euro says no, then they could probably finish the delict deal in a matter of a couple of days. And you're not dragging things out into mid-August and paying these inflated fees and ending up paying an extra on top of that. Um, but it's an interesting one. And I, I like the 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 approach overall, you know, when you look at their two seemingly top targets at center back were Gerard Brainthwaite, Lenny Yoro, young players on who would be on lower wages uh, that are young, top kind of exciting talents. But I think both of them are really good. You know, when you look at it are, are definitely the level of young players you want to get um, in the door and that if you can get them, you, you, you get them. And, uh, depending on sales and things, you know, the other interesting aspect to that is that in the, in the Euro or Delict category is neither actually fills the, the, the need that Gerard Braithwaite filled, which was a big, tall, fast left footed center back who can also cover left back, which is something that I think the athletic guys just mentioned on their podcast today is that that's sort of one of the reasons as well. It's either, or, is they're probably going to want to go back in for another center back on the left side afterwards mm -hmm. and get someone who can cover left back because all you have is Luke Shaw. We know his injury problems. We know what's happened there. <laughs> Malasia <laughs> has been out. Correct. Video, don't tell your I'm saying Luke Shaw. What's that? I've, I've I was just thinking of Jim Ratcliffe's video when he was saying, "Don't yeah, tell right. your heart. <laughs> you, Yeah, he, it's pretty funny. He knows. Everybody knows right, about Luke Shaw's injury problems, right? And we can hope he can stay healthy, and they're working on that. Um, but Jim looked like he'd had about 20 pints and a bunch of shit, in fact. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, Malasia, Malasia's return to training individually after 14 months of it being out, okay? You don't, you still have no idea whether he's ever, whether he's going to be fitting at that level, um, or even if he's good enough to replace Luke Shaw at this point in time, you know, there's a lot. So you need that coverage. And and you were mentioning this about Braithwaite and why it might be worth paying over the odds mm. for him is because of that being able to cover left back as well. Hard to see be, that. I know it would be difficult because of the Onana. With Onana going yeah. to Villa, it's hard to see it happening now, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, I, um, I was going to say, I wouldn't be surprised to see them try again one more time, but mm. really difficult now. Um but yeah, I I think simply because of that reason, though, because otherwise, you, who are you getting who's a left center back who can cover fullback also at a competent level? Um, mm -hmm. It's tough. Uh, it's a smaller market for that kind of specific, more specific type of player with a who's actually going to be worth spending the money on. Another piece of encouraging news was the return of Trail Malassia uh, yes. to training. Um, putting it in a bit of a weird situation because do you trust – your left back options, you know, Luke Shaw back fit. Uh, he looks mm -hmm. great when he comes back fit playing. Uh, don't hold him accountable for Spain's first goal, by the way. Um, but uh, you know, he, he makes such a difference when he, he does, plays. Yeah. Um, you've got Malasia. Do you bring in another left back and do you turn around and say, Look, last season will not be repeated? We're not going to have both these left backs out the whole mm -hmm. season. Do you go out yep. and say one? Uh, because it's one of those things that if if both those players get injured and any of us don't do something, they're gonna get slaughtered. But if they do yeah. something, how do you play how do you have three left backs? Yep. I agree. Well, but well, here's one of the factors. 
I don't think Malasio will be fit by the start of the season. I don't think he's going to be match fit by the start of the season. I think it's going to be difficult there in general, but I think they have to do one of two things. Like they have two choices in this, which is one sign a, a left footed center back who will cover in there. So they have a third option as needed or two sign another left back mm -hmm. and have Luke Shaw be able to cover at left center back too, which he can um, quite competently as well. But that means you need a really good left back. I'm not talking like some, something, someone who's not great. You want one who's capable of starting regularly mm -hmm. in case you need Luke Shaw covering at left center back. So yeah. you got to do one of those two. You've got to get that left center back in who can cover it, or you're going to have to find a sign a fullback. I think you don't have a choice. We can't go with Shaw and Malaysia and nobody else able to cover on that side. We just can't. <clears throat> um, Lissandro Martinez looks like he's back to full fitness. Um, there was a moment during a Copa America final when he was down. <laughs> and I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> Stress oh, me please, out. <laughs> please, please, please. And, know. you know, that, and, um, but he, you know, 120 minutes, brilliant. He played 60, 80 more minutes after that. So I'm sure yeah. he was okay. Yeah. So, uh, he brilliant center back, just fantastic Amazing. player. Brilliant to see him back. Very encouraging. And, um, again, a transformative football player. Man, I, I, I believe that you, you know, he was so, um, influential in that cup final. The difference that he makes in it is massive. <clears throat> Yes. So encouraging to see him back. But again, a vulnerability on that left hand side that United cannot uh, have next season. So uh, encouraging to see that. Um, Rangers this weekend. Um, do we know if Onana, if any of the other players will be back, Ahmad or Anthony or, um, you know, uh, they should. Yeah. Do I we, think that, we... but. Do we know if if if, the, if any of those players will return by then? Yeah, so they're they're expected to. Um, we'll see about McGuire because he's still working on that individual fitness kind of program um, we, and getting up. Wonder if Sancho will be in the squad this weekend. Sancho's available, yeah, and he should be ready because he's not having injury. He just returned a few days later, so he wasn't ready, but he should be available for the Rangers. Uh, for what Rangers, what response um, do you think we'll get from United fans? It's a good when question. I don't honestly know. I mean. You know, the thing with, with football fans is um, they have long and very short memories at the same time. Mm. If he plays well, it'll go well. <laughs> He'll get a good of reception. Course. If he gives the energy and the effort, like this is what I'm – if I was Jaden Sancho, the first thing I'd be doing in a preseason game is busting my ass into some sort of tackle or press mm -hmm. or something like that instantly. You know, put your put yourself out, put your body about, put it on the line – and show some um, something like that. And I think you do that, you win people over pretty quick. Um, yeah. I think Ten Hag, kind of his approach to it will help too, essentially. how he I think it helps, Sancho, that he starts in preseason. Those games are away from home. Before you get an old, a game at Old Trafford where you've got 80,000 people, you know, they're coming out here to the United States. They're, you know, So he can go and try to... You know, by the time the season starts, we're we're playing for real in front of you know United fans that you know it's not a bunch of kids and all that. There are there, mm -hmm. but there, there's you know eighty thousand people inside Old Trafford that you're going to see week in week out. He if he has a decent preseason, a really good preseason, shows the attitude that you um, have talked about. I think that that would help him immensely. I think it would also help Jaden Sancho immensely. And United have to be smart about this to do an interview, maybe with the MUTV or something. And even if he doesn't mean it, to give some sort of apology mm -hmm. to the fans and a commitment that you know this is behind him, that he wants to be successful for the football club, I, I do think that would definitely help him a lot. Um, but I want him to succeed. You know, yeah. I, I I can't. It's very difficult for me to invest in someone else's downfall emotionally and take any type of pleasure from that. I'm upset. I was upset at the way he handled things, no doubt. But, mm -hmm. you know, human beings are, we're, we're full of flaws. We're full of mistakes. We're full yeah. of stupidity. You know, I've made trillions of bad decisions, you know, but none of them are sinister. They're just stupidity. Mm -hmm, for sure. And, and and I made the comparison on the last podcast, which is which I said I wasn't, and then I did. But you know, it's like I said, 
he didn't do what the other forward who's departing United did. You know, it's it's a different it's a different discussion. And if and I, I hope he returns. I hope he wins. I hope everything goes well for United. And it would be nice. I mean, it'd be nice. You, you know, they put a little bit of even some little content of him interacting with Ten Hag and yeah. training things like that would make a big difference. I think Maybe in helping people get on board. And um, and it would be good for everybody because it, it's like I said. That's why I say you take the battle out of it. It's don't don't make it a war in the dressing room. Show that they're on the same side. They're behind the manager. They're they're all together. And it'll be easier for fans to get on board as well. Oh, I thought it was interesting that PSG are heavily pushing for, and forgive me if I butcher this name, uh, Desiree Doué, um, mm-hmm. which would indicate to me that they are quite confident Manuel Agarte will leave. Yeah. If United can get Agarte on loan with an option to buy, I think that's a dream deal. Yeah, I think so. I think if I think if they could get a loan, it's it'll be done. Um, I think that the nature of what comes at the end of that loan will obviously be a matter of if they can. And if they can't get a loan, then it's for sure they're going to have to get a pretty good price on it. But um, if they can get a loan, I think they, they could move it a little bit quicker. But otherwise, we're probably waiting on sales in the midfield as well, um, which is part of the part of the challenge there. Is, uh, so if they're waiting on sales in the midfield... Um... You know, there's been some debate over whether this 45 million, 40 million net spend is real or not. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out at the end yeah. of the season, at the end of the window, I suppose. Um, but so far, even if they go out, you know, so far, they're, you know, Xerxes is going to be covered essentially by the outgoings by Alvaro Fernandez that they got 6 million for. You know, mm-hmm. Danny Van der Beek, I know that they didn't get much for, but the wage bill's gone, you know. Yep. Um, of course, Varane's gone, Martial's gone, um, and uh, you know, I, I, so they're really at a, a zero net spend so far this summer, even with Cirque coming in. Um, they obviously have a, a center back position to take care of, but um, you kind of squeeze a lot into a very mm-hmm. small budget, yeah, you are, and I, I think realistically, we. I had somebody do a really good video kind of breaking down the, the PSR things. And one of the things also that happened is United have released some quarterly financials and last week mm-hmm. and showed a huge loss. And And United s- sources essentially indicated they're fine on PSR. They made it. But it is tight, really tight. You know, they were confident they were fine, which is why they weren't doing that horse trading that the other clubs were doing. But it is definitely tight. I mean, they're not in a situation where they can go blow 300, 400 million. It's just not happening. Um, and I think where it kind of comes down to is they probably have somewhere in the range of 50 to 70. You know, I think it's more a realistic number is the 50 to 70 range, um, in terms of kind of a net, a net spend. And it doesn't always work out to the exact numbers, but you can see that they've, they've bought Joshua Zerksi and they have a deal on the table for 50 million euros for, for Lenny Euro. So we know they have that much money, at least, right? That's what we've got for sure. Beyond that, we don't really know. Um, and yeah, it is a bit a bit tight, and they're going to need departures. Well, something we said on this show last week was about how these transfer windows now and the appraisal values of players are not comparable to anything we've seen before. Yeah, I think it was like a day or two after we did that, Mikkel or Tadek came out and said exactly the same thing. Just said, mm-hmm. look, this is yeah. nothing... It, it, nothing compares to what 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 has gone before. We're in completely new territory with everything. Yep. That decisions that we wouldn't have made before, we now have to make with letting certain players go, um, and even how we recruit because it's it's uh, you know it's prohibitive because of PSR. So so yep. you know haggling over small fees now become really important. You know, I mean, yep. even when you look at the Van der Beek thing, four hundred grand, you're looking at that going. You know, that's if you if you look at previous years, you know what United have spent money on. I mean, it's it it, it illustrates just how tight things are, and why deals can get dragged out now because small details make a huge difference. So, you know, I think we have to be careful. We're going, oh well, we've had 150, 200 billion to spend in the past. You know, yep. this is completely new territory. And there's really so is. few clubs with money to spend. Like, I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, you know, Newcastle, I mean, there's just so few clubs with, with deep pockets that have the ability to go out and spend huge money. So yep. um, I think, 
One thing, you know, I've said this before. You, I, I don't transfers don't move me the way they once did. You know, they used mm -hmm. to grip me, and I used to, you know, every minor detail I was, you know, entertained by. And now I'm kind of like, nah. You know, I'm a bit older now, and I, I don't know if my passion for the game is is waning, but this is something that I'm losing interest in and watching every minor detail of every minor movement. And it's sort of like, I don't know, I got some grief the other week for, for being a bit doom and gloom over something that is transferred. <laughs> it's, not that I'm, it's not that I think but, bad saying it. It's just that a couple of years ago, you know, I was signing was like um, a massive yeah. dopamine rush. And now I'm just so indifferent about it. It's like, I think United will be much, much better this season you know, because I think beyond even if they didn't make a sign and getting Shaw back, getting Martinez back will be huge for them. I think they'll be much, much better this season um, than what they were last season. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's interesting my attitude towards it. You know, there's burnout, but then there's also the fact of like, you get, you get excited about signing players because you think they're going to change what you're seeing week in and week out and you, you're going to see the improvement and, and you could fool yourself for many years. I think all of us into feeling like, mm -hmm. well, if we just got that guy, we're going to go to the next level. You know, if we just got this player, we're going to go to the next mm -hmm. level. Um, and then we get them and it goes to shit like more than half the time. And so you start thinking, how can I get excited about this when, more than likely, this player's not going to work out. I mean, look at all the money we've spent. Well, let me ask you this. How did you feel when Xerxes signed? I felt good. Did it move you anyway? I liked it. One, I was expecting it because that's the other aspect is how much more coverage we we put on all of these things as well. Um, I, I wasn't over the moon, for sure. I, I would not say I get ex as excited at all about signings as I used to mm. when it's done. It's more like, okay, that's good. Let's move on to the next one and the next thing. And for the most part, I'm sitting here like, I just want a season to start because I want to see how it goes. Mm. And I want to be, I want to watch the matches and I want them to be good. <laughs> you know, I mean, that at the end of the day, I think that's that's the only aspect of it where I'll get real excited is when when they get going and it works. And uh, and we start winning and we start playing better and and those things happen because I'm I don't know, too jaded to, in, to I mean, some degree to believe it at this point. Last season done a lot of psychological damage to me, and I hope it's oh, not yeah. permanent. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because, I know I'm Freaking. serious, like, there were so many Netty games my, my, but I felt like I was watching out of duty rather mm. than out of love. And yeah. it was a really weird feeling because most of the season just felt like you know, they weren't playing for anything. Cup final, but I love that. Yep. But, um, this was this really weird, listless feeling. Like they can't win the league. I lost any sense of hope that you know we're finishing the top four once they had an injury, once they lost Luke Shaw. Yep. I remember saying this on the podcast back in February. I think it was that um, I don't see any way that it can finish in the top four without an actual left back at the football club. Um, yep. And it just bred this sense of indifference in me that I don't like because. United have been one, you know, I've talked about my own mental health issues and everything. The one of the one things that's been consistent in my life that I've had this incredible love affair with that watching United have been able to lift me out of some of the most brutal despair. And no matter what's been going on in my life, this football club and this game has completely engaged me. But for significant parts of last season, it didn't do that. I don't know if, it, if it's VAR, if it's, this malaise that's I don't like yep. because um, yeah, there's not a lot of other things in my life that makes me feel that way. It makes me feel yep. that level of pleasure and that level of happiness, that that level of love. And I, I hope I get it back because I miss that being engaged yep. that way. And I really hope that uh, when the season starts, um, you know, there's that that trauma of last season. You know, is 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 gone. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I really. I hope so. Me as well. I know. It's, what you mean. it's just like so many games were boring. 
Yeah. So many of the games were meaningless. There were so many times where I just felt completely disgusted at what I was watching. Like we're watching that Crystal Palace away game. I just like, what? Why am I doing this? Why, why am I dead? They, they, they obviously don't care. Yeah. You know the sacrifices that I make in my life to watch something and just feel disconnected from what I'm watching and just be like, I, I, maybe there's two players on that field in my own team that I actually like the rest of them. Yep. The, their attitude, their body language, their, you know, their, their, their surrender, you know, their capitulation. Like it just infuriated me. It was like, what is left of the football club that I fell in love with? I hate the Glazers, right? I hate VAR. I hate the commercialism. I hate the greed. You know, I hate the branding. I hate the, you know, the social media aspect that's turned complete arseholes into stars, you know, into, you know, they, 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 they contaminate the whole discussion around the football club that, you know, are basically watching a football match on a screen, right? So people can watch it so they can have scripted reactions. I'm like, I fucking hate it all. Like, I mean, there's just so little left that I actually find valuable that... The commu- there's there's people within the United community that I love very much. Yep. I still love when United play well and you know they have amazing moments that can still motivate me and move me. I still love the fact that I have a very close relationship with my kid over Manchester United, where we talk about this. But the contempt that I have for so many of the other stuff um, is something that maybe that it's apex at its peak so i hope that next season i rekindle that love agreed agreed i really do hope so as well well what i would like to see is you need to bring in a couple of exciting players this summer that um move me i don't have they don't have to win the league you don't have to you know uh win the champ but you know obviously not champions league next season but i just want to be entertained a bit Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to see pragmatism. I don't want to see big. I, w- I want to be able to look forward to watching a game at the Yeti Hat again instead of yep. looking like this. Oh, so this is, like, I mean, let me know when it's over. Yep. I don't want to watch so many of the games. You might as well watch on Teletext because it's yep. just, it's all transactional. Just get the win. That's it. No, I wanted to just put more than that. Yes. You know, it's always been more than that. So, if you can't send the top players, that's okay. But send young players that come in and excite me and at the team and make me want to watch. They're hungry and motivated. Manu. Yeah. Yeah. It's why, why I love Manu, why I love Garnacho, Hoyland, you know, young yeah. players like that that excite me. That are going, okay, you know, there's something in that, like, that um, you can have paint by numbers and you can get really nice pictures from that. Or you can yeah. have the Mona Lisa that comes from, you know, this spontaneous, you know, art, this this creativity that moves you in a way that is not transactional. I I, I miss that. You know? Yeah. And I, I mean it goes back to something that Bell so was saying uh-huh. about the loss of the individual, where yes. everything is just solely about the win. Where there's no individual magic anymore. There's no genius anymore. There's no um you know the, the, everything's just so functional and and, and mechanical and it's like uh-huh. You know, the, even the VAR stuff, you know, which is just an attempt to remove human error from the equation, which just overanalyzes everything. I mean, the whole game yep. functions on an agreement between two people, uh, two teams that were going to bend the rules. Otherwise, yep. for, I mean, if you have an AI referee, the game stops every three seconds. Yeah, because exactly. what is what you know? What is enough contact for a free kick? That's you know, uh, that, that, that's subjective. You know, yep. where subjective application of rules allows the game to flow. And then you get a human being making a decision that then they're now asked to take three minutes to make a decision that would normally take three seconds. And now you start thinking about all these other influential variables that now mean you never get consistency because referees think about what decision did I give last week and what, what decision did I give a week before and what am my relationship like with this player and how inconsequential is this in the game? Um, what's is this home or away? All these things that you and I would be doing too, by the way, if we were in that situation. And then we get a decision that bears no resemblance to the actual offense. And then we're wondering why there's all this inconsistency because with this attempt to sanitize the game and remove 
all the abstract beauty from it that comes from uncertainty that that has human error built into Some it. randomness it, it yeah. shape man i just it yeah. just is, is is i know this is what i mean it goes back to paint by numbers everything has to be precise perfect yep. and when it's you the unpredictability that, of the whole thing that makes it makes it enjoyable yeah. One of the reasons why I thought about this is because when Scott McTominay scored that goal against Brantford, the second one, yeah, I didn't celebrate it. I sat there going, they're going to call us all said. They thought right. we all said. Yeah. And then two yeah. minutes later, they give it, and I'm like, but the moment is gone. Yep. It's like getting a win by court order. You know, like, the, what, what, this is what I mean by watching football and teletext. Let me know what the authorities decide, what counts and what doesn't. Yep. And then we'll, you know, this is fucking stupid. Like, what are we watching? Anyway, I don't want to get... So, but <laughs> I, I, I just, you know, honestly, like... I know. When you try to take... You rem, you know, when you try to remove human error and and remove the, the, the massive disappointment of having a decision go against you, you also remove the happiness. Yep. You know, so you can't do one without the other. Yep. And uh, anyway. All right. It's been an hour round. I'm going to leave it. <laughs> We're good. We're good. But, um, thanks to all of you for tuning in as always. Um, we'll be back next week, of course. Um, don't forget to tune in to my colleague here. He puts content out on a regular basis. So uh, much more regular than me. So uh, don't forget, uh, follow both of our platforms if you can. That's the best way you can support the show. Much, much appreciated. And uh, we appreciate the downloads and all the follows and all the comments on the pod. And um, we'll be back next week after the Rangers game. Take it easy, mate. Sounds good. See you later. Thank you. Cheers, bye.